Right, that is the basic light for the Alma King. We have an exciting program today, and I know the person I'm about to introduce, you all probably already know. But I do know this, if it were not for him, none of us would be here right now talking about those beautiful things out in that case and that we love so much. So would you please bring or allow a warm welcome for Brian Lees, president of Collector's Edge Minerals. Thank you, Dave. And thanks for all, uh, thank you all for joining us this afternoon. Can everybody hear me okay? Nodding way back there? Great, great, great. Loud and clear, good. good. Well, what a treat. This is a wonderful opportunity for me and uh, I hope for you too. I always love the opportunity to get together with everyone and talk about uh, the great discoveries and the wonderful things that have come out of the mountains of Colorado. And uh, today, of course, we're all here for the Royal Gathering. 
And the royal gathering was the result of, oh, a year of hard work. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's extremely commendable, first of all, that we have the opportunity to have this show at all. We have, uh, of course, the organizers. We have Christoph Keilman in the back and his, and his partner, Walter. Uh, thanks to them, we have this whole show. This, this show happened at, uh, at, at, at great expense. A lot of emotions went into it, a lot of, uh, a lot of stress and a lot of effort, but at the end, the goal was to pull this off. And uh, thanks to them, it's been pulled off in, in high style. We have one of the finest exhibition rooms in the whole world for minerals now, and the finest group of people you could get in the world to, to enjoy them. So thanks for coming. So they gave me a crash course on how to operate the uh, PowerPoint. Hopefully we don't go straight to the YouTube videos, let's see. So uh, just briefly, the Royal Gathering, I think probably all of you have seen it. It's out in the courtyard out here. We've got, the, of course, the Alma King, the Alma Queen, the Rose, Catherine's necklace, and uh, we're going to go into great detail how these things were discovered, and then we're going to get some commentary from some of the people that are responsible for, for maintaining and keeping these pieces in public view. So there's a diverse group in this, in this audience today. We've got experts down to people that have probably never seen a talk like this before, let alone know a lot about minerals. So I'm going to be a little generic in the discussion. But why, why are we presenting these rocks with such reverence? Why do we call it a royal gathering? So rhodochrosites from the Sweet Home Mine in Colorado have been proclaimed for decades as some of the world's finest mineral specimens. And one of the specimens in, in one of the cases, the Alma Queen, indeed back in the um, 1960s was proclaimed one of the finest minerals in the world, if not the finest mineral specimen in the world. So these things are pedigreed back decades, even over 100 years, for their desirability. And of course, one look at those cases, and you can understand why people might, might enjoy watching them, owning one, going to see them, and being involved in these projects. So one of the interesting things about the pieces that are out there, another reason that these are revered are they're in the very, very top percentages of all the specimens ever discovered at the mine. And the mine is over 150 years old, so that's quite a legacy. And what you're seeing outside are some of the finest examples that the mine ever produced. So, in, and of course it goes without saying, these specimens are aesthetically beautiful, extremely rare, very desirable. So thus the, the, the reverence in which that they've been presented to us this afternoon. So we, have a, uh, we are honored today to have the presidents and directors of five of the world's top natural history museums and geology museums sitting up here on our panel today. And I'd just like to briefly introduce them. You can see their names up here, but uh, starting on the far end, off on my far right, we've got George Sparks, who's the president of the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. We have Joel Barch, who is the president of the Houston Museum of Natural Science, or Nature and Science. Sorry, Joel. Yeah. That I've been called worse. And to his left, we have Aurora Giguet, who is the director of the Rice Museum. And the president of that same museum, we've got Gail Spann sitting to her left. And of course, to my immediate right, we have Renata Loeffler, who is the director of the Colorado School of Mines Museum of Earth Science. And each of them is responsible for one of the treasures that you have out in the case. And later on, we're going to do some Q&A with them to discuss the importance to their museums of these, these spectacular pieces. So what is rhodochrosite? Probably most of the people in this room know what it is but it's a naturally occurring manganese carbonate mineral. So what is a manganese carbonate mineral? So everybody knows the stuff that gets stuck in your pipes, that white gooey stuff, that's a calcium carbonate mineral. Very, very similar in chemical composition and chemistry to a rhodochrosite. It's just that with rhodochrosite, we've got manganese as a chromophore instead of, of calcium, and you get beautiful red crystals instead of the slime that coats the inside of your pipes. So thus we have manganese carbonate rhodochrosite. So it's not valued as an ore mineral. Uh, in our case, we opened up the mine to mine for the crystal itself, not silver, not gold, not any other industrial metal. This was actually opened up to mine for crystals. 
And this was, uh, as I know, as far as I know, the first time that um, an old silver mine had actually been converted, or any mine had been converted really from a ore mine, which used to be used to be a silver mine 100 years ago, into a rhodochrosite crystal mine. So it was kind of a novel concept back in the 80s that we promoted to, uh, to begin this idea and, and start this dream. Uh, it was literally just a dream to be able to go mine for these crystals, just a dream. So it, it, one of the reasons that drove that to us uh, was that rhodochrosite is probably one of the most popular collectible mineral species in the world. So there was a built-in market for this material. There was always a marketing angle because we had to make this thing economically successful. Uh, so we were driven to that because it was, even at the time we started this in 1990, it was, it was a revered mineral species. Everybody, every collector wanted to have one of these things and there were only a handful of them available. So there was a nice built-in market for us. So we had that to our advantage. You can see examples of rhodochrosite on the far, let's see if I can do this. Over there, okay. We've got some examples of rhodochrosite from the sweet home there. We've got then rhodochrosite samples from other parts of the world. Why is it so good at the, at the, at the Colorado sweet home mine? Well, we can't explain exactly why it's, it's so incredibly good. We're just lucky that we have an abundance of it at that spot. Rhodochrosite itself is not a rare mineral. The mineral rhodochrosite is a common, what they call gang, minerals in, uh, gang mineral in many ore deposits all over the world. It's just seldom do you see rhodochrosite crystallized the way that you see it at the Sweet Home Mine. So how does it happen? How does rhodochrosite form? I get asked this all the time, why did you know it was there? How did you go to, going to look for this crystal and in the environment? Well, the story of rhodochrosite at Sweet Home started over 30 million years ago. In Colorado, the rock, beautiful Rocky Mountains you see up here happened during, during something called the Laramide Orogeny, which is a mountain building time. The, the ancient Rocky, there was actually Rocky Mountains here hundreds of millions of years ago. They completely eroded, and these brand new Rocky Mountains popped up where you see them now. So at the end of the Laramide Orogeny, the mountains were formed, and the rock conditions were such that they were ready to become crystallized with all the phenomenal minerals that we see in Colorado. This is a graphic about how our mountains formed. So really the story of the Colorado Rocky Mountains started out in the ocean. And we get these things called tectonic plates. And there was a plate to the west, the oceanic crust, which was being forced underneath the, the North American plate. And it went down, and the North American plate popped up. And when it was doing that, there was a lot of heat and pressure down in these zones. And it created all kinds of wonderful opportunities for mineralizing fluids to come up through the fractures in the rock and then crystallize up in the Colorado Rocky Mountains. If you look at, this is a model that works for every single crystallized, mineralized deposit in the whole entire state. And the mineral belt runs from all the way from up around um, Boulder, diagonally down through the state, all the way down through Silverton to the Four Corners area of Colorado. So this is the story everywhere. Hot waters after, at about 30 million years ago percolated up as a result of all this tectonic activity and slowly deposited crystals uh, in the fractures that were created by all this tectonic movement. So what we've got, uh, and those hot water solutions are called hydrothermal solutions. These um, crystals grew basically out of hot water and so did all the other crystals. You've got galena, fluorite, calcite, tetrahedrite, um, sphalerite. We've got over 40 mineral species that crystallize at the mine. That, that, fan, that fantastic photo right here shows you what the inside of a pocket looks like. The pocket, that pocket dimension is about three inches wide, and those are rhodochrosites in there, and they're all just piled up on top of each other. So the pockets are tight, and um, uh, these mineralizing solutions, when they come up, are looking for these open spaces where temperatures change, pressures change, hydrothermal conditions change, and it allows the crystals to, to basically precipitate, in, you, you, all done science experiments where you've had the string in the water and you've mixed it up with a super hot solution of sugar and then you put the string, you let that water cool and you get the crystals slowly develop on the string. Very similar idea here, very similar. So what makes it so special? And we get it, we wonder that ourselves. So when we found crystals at the Sweet Home Mine, we started the project in 1991. 
we found there was a difference in the quality of the crystals. They were either cherry red or sometimes they were pink, sometimes they were solid pink, sometimes they were cherry red in the middle and pink on the outside. There were all kinds of forms of crystals in there. So we started a project. The USGS undertook the project with us and uh, Karen Weinrich, among others. Pete Madreski was involved, Jim Reynolds, several, several studied the internal chemistry characteristics of these crystals. And we learned, really, the reason that they are so good and red from the Sweet Home Mine is that they're absolutely pure manganese carbonate. There's almost no solution in there other than that. In other words, you don't have iron ions in there or copper ions or something that would contaminate the crystal and make it look opaque or brown or whatever. So uh, we actually studied the crystal chemistry from every single pocket we hit and, um, and learned all of these magnificent secrets about how rhodochrosite forms. It gives us a wonderful scientific opportunity to study this deposit. So what was the inspiration for taking the financial risk to do it? So in 1989, 1990, we were thinking about doing this project. Uh, I think I'd mentioned to you before that the ground was already fertile. There was already intense interest in the specimen. You might think back to the times back in the 60s and 70s and 80s when the mineral hobby itself started taking off and everybody started collecting mineral specimens as never before. Mineral specimen prizes were going up and demand for fantastic world-class specimens was going up. So there was almost a vacuum for this particular crystal. There were probably only a handful of good, uh, good pieces in the world uh, of, of this, of, of this mineral. So there was a great, uh, that was great impetus for us to do it. So in, in, in the 1970s, uh, there was a specimen uh, on the cover of a book by, that Peter Bancroft published called World's Finest Minerals and Crystals. And lo and behold, on the cover of that is the Alma Queen. It was the fantastic specimen discovered in the 1960s, 1966, when the mine itself was still an active silver mine. But in those days, silver prices weren't so good, mining costs were high, and they decided to turn the mine from a silver mine into a possible roto mine. So they spent a few months on that. They got very lucky very early, and they uh, walked right into this, uh, within 10 feet of one of the drifts underground, right into a pocket to produce that magnificent specimen. So through, um, uh, really, this, this specimen itself and that find kept the dream alive for the subsequent work that we decided to do. So the Alma Queen was discovered in 1966 by John Soles and Warren Good. John Soles had a lease on the mine. Warren Good was working for him. And Warren Good was mining um, uh, for silver. John told him to turn his activities to these crystals because these, these were, a, this was a novelty in the 60s. And they thought, wow, maybe we can find some crystals and make some money in this mine. So lo and behold, about 10 feet away from one of the drifts, they, they found this fantastic specimen. And it incidentally made news all over Colorado. All the mineral dealers knew about it. And a good friend of mine, uh, George Robertson, who's no longer with us, uh, was contacted at, in those days. He and his partner, Merle Reed, were, uh, crystal, uh, were dealers with a dealership called the Crystal Gallery. George was working at Safeway. He was, I think, a 19-year-old kid. And he was uh, smitten with this. He was told about the rock, and I think it was on a weekend. He cashed every check for $20 he could find at every Safeway in Denver, put $2,500 in cash in his pocket, and he went up to the mine and he bought that rock. So now it was, it was in private hands, and that mineral specimen ended up at the 1967 Las Vegas Gem and Mineral Show, where uh, a group of um, contemporary experts got together and proclaimed this the world's finest mineral specimen. So that was just the beginning of the story of this famous piece. It, it uh, then went from Peter Bancroft's collection um, to David Wilbur, and, to the, uh, and then you can see a price increase here. Within about eight years or so, the piece traded for about $85,000. So you can see in that decade right there, there was a, an incredible surge in interest in fine minerals. As a matter of fact, it was, David Wilbur was one of the early pioneers of this. There was this push to make mineral specimens a collectible, iconic category in itself. And it really hadn't been elevated to that level before. There was pieces like this that did it. The Alma Queen was famous for turning the whole mineral world on its edge, on its ear. So then uh, in 1979, Ed Swoboda purchased a specimen who just happens to be the father of our videographer in the back who's, who's playing Pong on his cell phone. <laughs> and uh, and uh, hey, Brian's dad, Edward, uh, ended up selling the Alma Queen to Perkins Sam's, famous, famous oil tycoon in, in Houston, 
who in turn, uh, his collection was purchased by the Houston Museum of Natural Science in 1984. And she reigns, to, uh, she reigns in that position to this day. So if you want to see it again after it leaves this facility, you've got to get on an airplane to Houston and, and check it out. How did, how did we actually start doing it? And it was sort of a pipe dream. It was a concept dream to open up, up, open up this mine to mine crystals. So uh, back in the late 90s, um, I had the opportunity to meet the owner of the Sweet Home Mine. And he, he and I got together in discussions about reopening the mine as a crystal mine. He'd taken this, pro this project around to several others during that day, in that day, and nobody wanted to pull the trigger to do it. Um, at that time, we decided what we would do. We was, uh, my wife Catherine and I, uh, which formed Collector's Edge Minerals, Inc., we, we put together a group of investors, which was the only way that we could afford to reopen it. We got these guys together, and we reopened the mine in 19... Um, 1991, in spring of 1991. So there's, it's, it's always a pretty risky endeavor. I mean, many of the people in this room are field collectors. You've been out, you've, you've dug for rocks. You know how hard it is to find something that's really good. I mean, how often do you find a, a treasure, you know, in the, in the backyard? And it happens once in a while. But, but uh, a mineral specimen pockets as rare as a drop of water in the ocean. And if you think of all the rock in the, in the Earth's crust, and you think about the potential volume for crystal cavities, it's minuscule. So first of all, you've got to start in the right spot. You've got to, have, you've got to be in a place where you think there might be some crystals and, um, and hope there's more there, and then you have to have a lot of hope and luck. So we, did, we put all that together. So the big question in those days, and there were a lot of people betting against it, would there be, the question was, would there be enough mineral specimen potential there to, to make it work? Would there be any more great treasure finds to be had? So to get there, um, it wasn't just taking a pick and going out underground and starting to knock on the walls of a mine. We had to do a lot of work. The, um, the work involved all the things that you involve in a modern mining process. There's a lot of mine planning, budgeting. There's um, a, a lot of geology that needs to go into it. Um, and fortunately, we, we, we didn't, well, we didn't really have a book to tell us on how to mine crystals. We had a lot of smart people with us that, that had a pretty good idea on what to do. And uh, it, wasn't, um, it wasn't long until Dean Missantoni, you see, you can see Dean sitting next to me here, Dean Missantoni, um, had worked out the structural geology of the mine. And it turned out that the structural geology was the clue to figuring out where the pockets were. We mapped every single crack, feature, fissure, everything in that mine because we didn't know it was important. And then when we started mining, we kept track of everything we were finding, the chemistry, the, the, what was coming out of the pockets, how they related to structure, and so on and so forth, until empirically we were able to start to put together this puzzle, which was, which was just fascinating. It turned out in the early days our best, um, our best silver bullet was understanding structural relationships between the faults and fissures that had been put together after this, during this Laramide orogeny we talked about. So we tried a lot of things. We we'd studied fluid inclusions. We studied the chemistry of the crystals. We did ground penetrating radar, which was, a, which was the, I think, the first application of ground penetra penetrating radar to a mining, uh, specimen mining project in the world. Um, a lot of mine safety planning, compliance with MSHA, compliance with the state, all the things attendant with a, with a modern mining operation had to be addressed. Uh, there's, there's no there's no writing under the radar screen anymore in terms of mining anything anywhere in Colorado or anywhere in the United States. Just to give you an idea, you know, even back in those days, we were spending fifty to hundred thousand dollars a month to keep a six-person crew active underground at the mine. So you can see how the, the meter was running. We were burning through cash at a high rate of speed, and um, we we found them. We found pockets very, very infrequently. As a matter of fact, the very first year we had it, we didn't find hardly anything. And as a matter of fact, we ran out of money the first year we had it. Uh, we had found one nice little crystal for a year's worth of work, and we went back to the investors and said, please give us some more money. We can find something. So we did. We ended up getting some more money, and we worked it for several more years. We were very fortunate the next year to find a fantastic pocket or two. But um, it's interesting and, and, and quotable to, to, to understand that it takes, it can be million, it, it, putting, it, and this is for mines all over the world. Between pockets, you could spend several million dollars just looking for the next one. You don't just go in and hit one and hit one and hit one and hit one. So how long would it take and what did you do to actually get it? The physical, um, one of the things a lot of people don't understand is the physicalness of the work. 
It's an extraordinarily physical activity. You're working at 11,500 feet. Imagine taking a 100-pound drill on your back with one hand walking up a metal ladder to go up into a stope so you can drill and blast your next round. That happened as a daily exercise up there. Um, I worked at the mine for about eight years myself, and that was a, my, one of the most fortunate things for me that I'd ever done because I got to learn and see and feel and understand this mine at a visceral level until we started finding the pockets. But these, these shots here show you, this is a guy named Nate Arnold. He's, um, and drilling on the vein. See that vein right there? That's the, you can see the red roto in it right there. That was an extraordinary day. You don't usually see what we call a face that looks like that. So he's getting ready to drill and, and shoot that. This is right on the edge of a fantastic pocket. We called it the Nate's pocket. And we had crystals in there that were up to an inch and a half with um, one inch purple fluorites on them. This was an un unbelievable pocket find. You can see these, um, and this next photo on its right is the there's some, some guests in here looking at us getting ready to, to blast upwards. So a blast might be 20 or 30 holes. Each one's filled with a stick of dynamite or a blaster. Then it's filled with ANFO, ammonia nitrate, which is fertilizer mixed with diesel. Um, I think Oklahoma City. And we pack all that up in there, and then we blast it. And it's in a certain sequence so that you can blow the rock down um, and expose the next face. So we constantly drill, probe, make sure we don't hit anything good, and then we blast. So we we're very, very careful not to blow up the pockets. It's interesting, you know, when you're drilling, that if you hit a pocket, your drill just leaps forward. So you stop, you step back, and then you probe around that hole to see if anything is, is, is good inside. If it's not, you shoot. If, uh, if there is something good in there, all, all mining activity stops, and then we go into collecting activities. So how do we do that? So, once we get into a good pocket zone, we don't drill and blast anymore, but we still drill. And we drill all around the pocket. And um, this is Graham Sutton right here. We've drilled around a little pocket up here. We drill about 20 or 30 holes all around it. And then we insert something called a hydraulic splitter. That's the business, that's the uh, hydraulic ram part, or the hydraulic um, part of it. And then what you can't see is a metal rod that goes in that expands, it's a feather and wedge, with about a quarter million pounds of pressure, it carefully cracks the rock so we don't blow up the pockets. So sometimes if we drill into one of those pockets and, it, and we're four or five feet away from it, we have to split by hand several tons of rock. Again, 11,500 feet. You can, in about three months, you're either dead or you're in really good shape. So here's an extraordinary photo I wanted to share with you. Um, that is the Alma King crystal in situ. That crystal you see on that plate out there is that crystal. And um, I put a tape measure on to measure it. It was five inches across the short side and six and a half inches when we got it out across the diagonal. But this gives you an idea of the geometry, the dimensionality of these pockets. They're only two or three inches wide. That crystal was laying in there loose. I was able to pluck that out and then we mined out very carefully using the hydraulic splitters all the rock around it. So we pulled out hundreds of pounds of, um, of plates doing that technique and we were able to reattach those crystals. So that's how you end up seeing what you've got out there in the lobby. About a year after we hit the Alma King, um, there, were, there was a company in the United States that developed a, this cool thing called the diamond chainsaw. The diamond chainsaws came into existence in 1993 and we bought the very first ones and we were able to go up using the hydraulic splitter, crack open the pockets, and then use the diamond chainsaw to extract the specimens. So we found the first specimen in August 31st, 1991, but it wasn't until August of 92, when all the money was spent, that we hit the Alma King. So there was about a frantic year there. Um, and when we hit the Alma King pocket, we actually called it the Rainbow Pocket because it had many, many different colors in it. That's, we, we, we came up with the name Rainbow Pocket. But it was opened up in what we call the tetrahedrite drift. And it took, us so, um, it took us really over a month, it says September 5th, but it took about a month to pull everything out. There were hundreds of crystals inside. I mean, you can imagine um, rhodochrosite stacked up like cordwood. Probably two, three hundred crystals came out, enough to fill th four of these tables. Came out of a hole that was only about six feet long and, and two inches and three inches in diameter. It was just full of crystals. The picture on the lower left is a, um, a photograph of the, uh, one of the raises 
And some of these raises, we'd start at drift level, down, you know, walk-in level, and some of the raises would go up 75, 100, 150, almost 200 feet. Up, up through these um, warrens, and each one of those things is called a stope. So we've covered that a little bit. On August 21st, we found, we found the Alma King pocket, and um, this gives you a, an idea for scale. That's me holding that crystal in my hand right after we pulled it out of the crack, and, um, and that's it when it was uh, the lower, the lower left photo here is when that specimen crystal was put back on its matrix plate, and it fit on there perfectly, and its little buddy on the left there. But uh, what's ironic about this, and, and, and how much luck can play into your life, is, you know, I told you we probed, try not to blow up the pockets, but we probed within eight inches of that pocket and didn't see it. When we blasted it, we blasted 15 tons of rock, extraordinary force, bam, right up against it, and it didn't destroy it. Thought we'd knocked it actually off the matrix, but it turns out it'd been off the matrix for a long time. So we missed blowing the Alma King up literally by that much. Missed it by that much on the good side. So the other extraordinary piece that came out of that same pocket was the Alma Rose. The Alma Rose is a magnificent photo. We call it the Rose for obvious reasons. And the, what you don't get a sense of scale on when you look at that specimen out there is how tightly it grew up against the Alma King. So I'm going to hold my hands up, but the, the um, pocket was pretty close to vertical. One was a, there was a hanging wall plate and a, and a foot wall plate, and the pocket was about that wide. So on the foot wall side, the crystals were growing down, and if there was a space on, uh, on the hanging wall side, from the hanging wall side, there would be a crystal coming up from the foot wall that would be growing right up underneath the hanging wall crystals. So they were growing in here like this, and the crystals didn't touch the opposite walls. So they completely filled up the cavity without contact and it produced perfect, undamaged, uncontacted specimens. So the Alma, the Alma Rose is the um, companion piece to the Alma King, and they form right next to each other, facing each other, in a very, very narrow seam. So now the hard part. You know, you thought you worked pretty hard, but it's not gold or silver. You can't melt it in an ingot. You can't go down to the Denver Mint and say, hey, give me money. So we brought these things out to the world, and um, we started trying to find people that would purchase these things. And we took them all around. We had uh, a lot of people looking at them. So at, at the time, we, we, uh, we showed them to many, many top collectors and museums and so on and so forth. And at the end of the day, uh, what, it, what ultimately happened was, and a miracle occurred at a mineral show, is that the Rice family came. Richard and Helen Rice came, and they met up with, um, with us and asked us if there was anything special at the show. And they hadn't been at a mineral show in something like 15 years. It was a long time between their coming to shows. And they were uh, invited to come over and look at, the, at both of the pieces, the Alma King and the Rose. And they were so taken with them that they decided to buy them both. But it was only a few months later that they decided that they would let one of them come back to Colorado. So they let us have the Alma King back. They thought that the king should be in Colorado. So we got that back. And then um, we met the people. We met Bill Coors at the Coors Foundation. And uh, the, the, the foundation, the dist, uh, through, the, um, through the help of Bill Coors himself, decided to purchase the piece and donate it to the Denver Museum. And that's how it ended up back there. So fortunately for us, the, the Rice family decided to let it go so it could come back to Colorado. What about that wonderful piece of jewelry that you see up in the front? Well, sometimes, you know, we're blasting or, or there's a boo-boo or some of the minerals are broken. Some of the crystals, they're not, maybe they're not fit for specimens, but they might be fit for something else. We, we found out early on that they cut a fabulous, fabulous gemstone. And since rhodochrosite's only the hardness of about three and a half to four, it's not suited well for rings, but it makes a wonderful, wonderful necklace or earring combination. So we found out early on that there was a market for that, and uh, we took some of the crystals out of that Alma King pocket, and we, 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 uh, uh, I, we didn't do it, but um, Buzz Gray um, designed and built this necklace. Um, I actually designed it. I think it was Kim Knox in San Diego actually built the necklace, and it was put together back in the 90s. The center stone in the piece you see out there weighs 14 carats, and the total weight is about 36 carats. It's one of the finest um, um, rhodochrosite jewelry uh, pieces ever made, probably the finest. And uh, we're lucky to have that one here. You can, you can see it if you come to the Colorado School of Mines Museum. 
uh, the Earth and Science Museum, and you can see that on permanent display there. So all, th all good things come to an end. If there's one thing about life, it's, it's gonna change. So we were working about 14 years at the project, and we, we were just topped out. Our stopes were too high. We'd run out of targets down at the level we were working. We decided to shut the mine down. So uh, in 2004, we did that. The, um, this, this is a picture of, of putting in cement in the portal. We plugged it all up, and then we covered it all up, and that's as it is today. It's, it's a grassy slope that you would never, you would never know there was a mine uh, ever in this location. So a little bit of retrospective uh, look back. The, for all the years we worked, about 14 years, I think we found 1,000 collectible specimens. And, and that's from you know, nice specimens from a few hundred dollars up to specimens of phenomenal value, seven-figure rocks. So the, the, the thousand specimens were sold to collectors, to museums, to you know, people that really just wanted, a lot of people just didn't collect anything but roto. They bought rotocrosite specimens and just put them away. So if you took a look at, um, if, once you look back in the early, early part of the discussion, we're always thinking, is this gonna break even? Are we gonna make any money? Um, you know, we never had thoughts of anywhere near the kind of success that we ended up having. But looking back and looking at prices today on rotos as they've continued to go up in the marketplace, we know that we produced out of that one stope area over $140 million worth of crystals from that one spot. So it gives you some perspective uh, on, on what we did in there. Back in 2016, Dean, Miss, and Tony and I got back together, and we decided that there might be some targets up above where we left off. So we repermitted the mine, we reopened it in 2016, and we've been mining up there for over four years now. We've had some success. We um, found some nice, from fairly nice pieces. This one is on the cover of um, Lapis Magazine. Uh, this one right here is, is now in, down in Houston. Not at the museum yet, but maybe, maybe. <laughs> we call this one King Henry. This thing is a phenomenal three and a half inch crystal on matrix. And we got a photo here of one of our guest panelists here. Joel, Joel Barge came up to the mine to, to enjoy it one day and he's holding uh, a crystal from one of, our, one of our new pockets. And we call this one the Detroit City Portal of the Sweet Home Mine. So that's, that's it for me for this part of the talk. I appreciate you listening, and um, I'm going to sit down and let you guys take it away. What a story. Thank you so much. Tremendous story. But before I get to the panel, <clears throat> before I get to the panel, we wanted to make sure that you saw what happened a few days ago when they brought the specimen here. The city of Alma brought three keys to present to the three specimens, the Alma Rose, the Alma King, and the Alma Queen, and made them honorary citizens of the city of Alma, Colorado. <laughs> And there they are. If you haven't already seen them out there, clearly you must go look at them before this is all over. So let me, let me turn to the panel. You know who these people are. It's a very distinguished panel. Uh, George, the first thing that comes to my mind is, you must see this often, what in the world kind of response do, do you see that people give when they see the specimen in the museum? So when I go around the community and I, people learn that I work at the museum, the, invariably the first thing they say is they love the gym and mineral hall. That's what their favorite place. And a lot of times I'll have guests and I'll take them through there. And you walk down the long hall and you see the Mexican crystal cave and then you turn that corner and you see the Alma King. And um, average visitors coming through there, the second most uh, prominent response that I get is, is that real? <laughs> they, they want to know if it's real. And then they ask, is it cut? How, how, who, how was it formed like that? And as uh, Brian said, our photographer, Dave Basinger, was up there the day that, that they took this out. And there's a little video there that you can see it, and Brian's pulling it out. The most common response that we get of anything is people say, who is that man? Those are the most beautiful masculine hands I've ever seen. <laughs> and, and I just have to say, yeah, that's Brian. 
<laughs> That's great. I'm getting hand model in my next life. <laughs> uh, Joel, at the at the Denver, I'm sorry, at the Houston Museum of Nature, Natural Science, uh, I, I bet you can see, or maybe you can reflect a little bit on how you think the specimens have changed mineral collecting in general, the, the mineral world. Do you think these specimens have had a, a significant influence on, on the mineral collecting world? Well, that's a, a very, very long answer, but I'll try to keep it brief. First, I want to thank Christoph and his team and all you guys for making this show happen. <laughs> it's a minor miracle that it came together, and it, it's fabulous. Second, I want to apologize to all of you who bet against me showing up. <laughs> <laughs> Wayne and Donna Light's son, many years ago, nicknamed me Sasquatch. Because I figured, you know, you know, he's rumored to exist, but rarely seen. But then I found out he was referring to my physique. So, oh well. Well, I mean, there's kind of two parts to this story. First, you know, I remember the first time I ever saw the Alma Queen was September 9th, 1974. Isn't that crazy that I remember it? Um, you know, if you take your, your mind into the Wayback Machine, you know, you have to remember that this was probably the most famous mineral on earth. And as an absolute mineral nerd, who instead of having a Farrah Fawcett poster on my wall, I had a picture of the Alma Queen on my wall. <laughs> Being able to see that the first time was a magnificent experience. And you know, I, I knew a little bit about the history, about it, discovery and it changing hands. And, and you know, Dave Wilbur, he brought it to the Shamrock Hilton and for the mineral show in Houston. And at the time he had this big stretch limousine and he load up his rocks, he drove all over the country. He drove to every small mineral show, big mineral show, promoting his collection, but that was the central piece. I mean, Tucson wasn't the big mega show. I mean, he, I remember he went to the San Antonio show, and they're, literally their security system for the Alma Queen was a little string that was tied to it, and through the bottom of the case hung a cowbell. <laughs> and and that, the, the people at the show knew that they had to protect this most important rock, and I guess that's the best system they came up with. But you know, back in the 70s, and I don't think I'll get in too much trouble for this, you know, mineral prices were very volatile. They were going volatile, they were going up, up, up. But a lot of it was kind of like a check-kiting scheme between Keith Proctor and Dave Wilbur. <laughs> so you never really knew what these things were actually worth. But I think the price of 85000 is the ac is an accurate estimate of the price. And that really turned everyone's head. I mean, I think it was part cash, a used Rolls Royce, and a macaw <laughs> that totaled 85000 But for the first time ever, there was a legitimate price of 85000 And that transformed mineral collecting because people were starting to go, wow, you know, these things are worth, now we can not worry about mining copper and accidentally finding pieces. We can go after these things as mineral specimens that have value in and of themselves. Um, we, we talked earlier, I think I was talking with Jim, uh, that you know, mineral prices, there's never been like a, you know, the Netherlands tulip bulb explosion. I mean, we've never had like big valleys, but there have been plateaus. So the next time that thing really cha changed hands was when we bought the Perkins Sam's collection, and Ed might be able to fact check me on this, but I think we also had it at $85,000 in 1983. 1984. Now, if you guys remember 1983, the early 80s in Texas, and specifically in Houston, it was, an, it was not an economic recession. It was a full-blown depression. And at the time, the museum was probably 25,000 square feet. By the way, today it's 430,000 square feet. And 85,000 for one rock was just lunacy. I mean, they were brand new apartment complexes and thousands of brand new homes that were being bulldozed because the economy had gotten so bad. And there was a board meeting at the museum said we're going to, two items on the agenda. We're going to close the museum and just give it up. You pee on the fire and call in the dogs, as the Texans say. We're done. Or we're going to buy the Perkins Sam's collection for $6.1 million, the centerpiece of which, also the rabbit ears, was the Alma Queen. And that acquisition transformed the museum. Back then we had a 500 square foot antique Egyptian, I mean, Egyptian Antiquities Hall. Um, in, in November we're about to open a 45,000 square foot one. We had a 2,500 square foot dino, dinosaur hall. It's now 60,000 square feet. We have a $40 million energy hall, a $35 million chemistry and physics hall, 
I know, you guys don't care about that, but I'm telling you, if we hadn't bought the Sam's collection, at the time the museum was free, for, turned out to be $4.5 million, another footnote, everyone thinks he sold it to us, we actually bought it from the FDIC, because I think Perkins helped collapse the savings and loans in Texas, but, and it was collateral, right, Ed? I think I got that right. <laughs> um, so that moment, we went from a free museum with, they claimed 25,000 visitors a year, I don't believe it was that high. For the first time ever, we charged admission, which was a dollar, and we went in one year to 400,000 visitors based on the Sam's collection. But the centerpiece, the one piece, we had billboards of this thing in Houston, was the Alma Queen. So the Alma Queen not only transformed mineral collecting into the big leagues where it became almost a fine art asset class, um, it, it literally saved and ignited the Houston Museum of Natural Science. Wow, great. There you go. I, I wasn't necessarily intending to just move down this way with my questions, but now that we've talked about the king and the queen, let me ask uh, Aurora about the rose. This is an amazing specimen, and I know that uh, it is probably really, it's, it's, the, it's the icon of your collection, I'm sure. And how, how significant is it to the Rice Northwest Museum of Rocks and Minerals? Um, well, it is the cornerstone of our collection, um, most like Joel's. Um, I think as a, a family founded Rocks and Minerals Museum, it is the touch point of what we can tell mm -hmm. the story. So we not only use it as a scientific teaching tool, but more importantly, I think, we teach about mining and perseverance and collecting. Um, as a museum founded by collectors, it is our responsibility to help grow or inspire the future collectors that then will help support the, the mineral community. So we see it as our major teaching tool for the museum. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's a beautiful thing. Yeah. And as long as I'm marching down the table this way, Gail, uh, I, I know you're from Texas. Uh, I have to ask, wh why, wh why uh, such an interest in the a museum that's in Hillsboro, Oregon? Well, why are you involved? What's going on? Well, Jim and I have a passion and a home full of minerals. And the Rice Museum is a couple that had a passion and a home full of minerals. And it really... Um, it really spoke to me. I felt like a, a strong kinship. And when I first started collecting, everybody would say to us, you need to see the Rice Museum. You need to see their collection and the Alma Rose. And perchance, I ran into some board members who twisted my arm and had me on the board. And I now preside over the board. And I couldn't be prouder than than being there and feeling that kinship and helping to keep our museum relevant and being proud to be able to claim that we have the Alma Rose. Yeah. The Alma Rose is spectacular. It is spectacular, there's no doubt about it. I'm enjoying looking at it out there every day. Okay, so the museums are, are playing a major part of this and obviously the only other museum we haven't talked about that has though in this case, the necklace. You've seen Catherine's necklace out there in the display case along with the other three icons. Uh, Renata, why, but your perspective is more than on the gemological side. What, what is the significance of it gemologically for you in the museum? Sure, so um, I have a background in both minerals and gems. And um, when I first saw the necklace, I appreciated what it was. When, when a regular person comes through the museum and they see it, they think, oh my goodness, look at that beautiful gold necklace and it has these gorgeous red gems. Um, so I just, I know we have experts in here, but in case you aren't a gemologist or you aren't a gem cutter, I have, I have actually used some words <laughs> from other cutters, okay, to explain to you why this particular piece of jewelry is so special. Um, so rhodochrosite is soft, we already talked about that, three and a half to four, right? Um, so what, what would a gem cutter say about faceting rhodochrosite? Um, best to try on a non-expensive piece at first. They aren't easy to cut. Slow, cool, and careful is the rule. Good luck, and I gave up. <laughs> okay, so let's 
dive into that a little bit. What what does that mean? Um, yeah, it's soft. There's a lot of soft minerals, and that's why it wouldn't typically be considered something that would be appropriate for jewelry, right? Um, but this is such a gorgeous gem. It's got really nice clarity, super saturated color. It's, it's spectacular. Um, but in addition to being soft, it also has cleavage in three directions. So if you don't know what cleavage is, it's basically planes of atomic weakness. Um, so in addition to having something that's soft and easy to break, it could also shatter should you try to put a facet on the wrong angle. Um, so that makes for a fun time. Okay, so what else is crazy about rotocrosite as a gem? It has high birefringence. Um, so like calcite, it's doubly refractive. So when light enters the gem, the rays split, um, and you can see doubling. And the thing about gems is if you don't orient your gemstone the appropriate way when you're cutting it and you have a really highly birefringent gem, that doubling can make it look hazy and what we call sleepy. So that's not good. So for, ever, for whoever cut those gemstones, Brian, it's pretty, that's pretty insane. It's, an, it's a really crazy feat to imagine taking that material and cutting it without it like exploding, which would be horrific. I'm glad I'm not a faceter. Um, what else can we say? It's also temperature sensitive. It's also chemically sensitive. It's sensitive to vibrations. So what you don't know, unless you look at it carefully, is those gems that are set in the necklace are actually um, adhered in there with a glue. And you might be like, oh my gosh, glue, the horror. No, 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 it's really, it's good. It, it's like a cushion. So if that necklace gets banged on accident or bumped in any way, it sort of protects it from vibration and protects it from breaking. Um, so that's pretty spectacular. It's also really rare. Um, I, looked, I looked at this article back in March of this year in, in National Jewelers Magazine and the claim, and you can, you can tell me, Brian, if this is correct, but the claim is that as of March of 2021, facetable Colorado rhodochrosite, meaning like gem quality material, good stuff that could be cut into gems by a brave, brave soul, um, would fit into like a single box, right? That's correct. Yeah, that's crazy, guys. I mean, no offense to diamonds. I'm going to make a carbon faux pas here. Um, <laughs> but that's, that is a lot... <laughs> That's a lot rarer, okay, um, than your average gemstone. Um, and I am a fan of average gemstones like tourmaline, okay? It's good stuff. Um, and then the last thing I wanted to say is if it's on display in a museum and it has its own postcard, that must mean it's pretty special. <laughs> right? It's, it's, it's pretty special. Um, and I will say this, at the museum right now in Golden, we only have two significant items of jewelry on display. And this necklace, Catherine's necklace is one of them. And the other one is um, the Miss Colorado Tierra, the crown, which is pretty super popular too. Um, and then one more fun fact for all of you who are maybe still questioning how rare and important this is as a gem, because I know they're all mineral people. They're like, don't cut that specimen. Don't do it, sacrilege. No, but as Brian will tell you, these are not crystals that would be specimen quality, right? They, they, they're imperfect in some way. And so to be able to reuse those in something as exquisite as jewelry is important. Um, but regarding value, can I speak to value just briefly? Um, this is, again, is, is from an interview with National Jewelers Magazine just this March. Rhodochrosite, sweet home rhodochrosite gems that are three carats or more have doubled in price over the last five years, and gems that are 10 carats or more have nearly tripled since 2004 mm -hmm. in their value. So this is, this is like a really rare, spectacular thing. Wow. Yeah. So you have to go get that reappraised maybe, huh? <laughs> Or I could wear it. <laughs> <laughs> I have to ask you, has Catherine actually ever worn that? Yes, she did. As a matter of fact, um, she wore it several years ago. Joel, when did you remodel the museum? 96? Yeah, I think so. Six, 96, 97. 96. Yeah. Uh, Joel came out with a spectacular display at the Houston Museum. He completely renovated it with a brand new concept and case lighting and exhibitory. And uh, she wore it to the gala event that night. <laughs> oh, that would be <laughs> the appropriate place for it. Sure. Joel, you have three pieces then, the, the queen and the rabbit ears and the Henry the Ninth. Yes, 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 yes. Are you planning on doing anything special with the three of them? I'm waiting for Brian to find a better one. <laughs> <laughs> I do have a quick story. I have to look at Brian down there because every time I pick up the phone to call him or he calls me, he sends me a non-disclosure agreement about this thick that I have to sign before he'll talk to me. So if I start saying anything I'm not allowed to know or say, just 
<laughs> but I remember um, when the, the when the Rose and the King were becoming known. I got a phone call from Brian, and you know we're just like, "Hey, how you doing?" Blah blah blah. He goes, "You know, hey, you know, how big is the Alma Queen?" And I'm like, "I don't know, four inches across, corner ground, five, three, I don't know." And he's like, "No, no, I really need to know." And I'm like, "Wait a minute, <laughs> why does he care how big the Alma Queen really is?" <laughs> so. Eventually, we, I, I took one of my long-standing and most generous board members up to visit Brian, who, God bless him, he gives away like 200 college scholarships a year to, to high school kids from uh, disadvantaged neighborhoods or incomes. So he has a heart of gold. But when it comes to rocks, he is tighter than the bark on a tree. A guy named Henry Hammond. So do you remember that slide up there when it said private collectors and museum curators came and they were speechless and their jaws dropped, but none of them pulled the trigger? <laughs> and he, <laughs> so they ended up in two great homes. <laughs> so um, we already had the Alma Queen, so you know, no need to be greedy. But but Henry Hammond just loves negotiating a deal, and I think his offer was like embarrassingly low. I was like, Henry, you cannot call Brian and tell him that number. Now, now to Brian's credit, he was polite and friendly, and probably laughed a little bit. But he turned he turned down the offer. So. Um, I was astonished when I saw those two pieces. It was bigger and better than anything I thought had, had come ever before, and maybe never again. Um, you know, best of luck to his mining operations now. I think it's great for the hobby. I think it's great for the business. It's even great source of cutting rough for the gym people. <laughs> but I think what we saw certainly in '66 was a, a miracle discovery, total accident, and what they what they've done up till now has been a has been a great thing for the collecting hobby. It's, you know, in sports they say GOAT, greatest of all time. I mean, you can make the argument that rhodochrosite is the greatest mineral species of all time for collectors, and those three out there are the greatest rhodochrosites of all time. So the goatiest goats in the mineral collecting world are sitting right out there. And congratulations to all of y'all for putting this together. Yeah. Okay. So, so, George, I have to... Oh, I yes, would just right. like to add that today yes. is the 20th anniversary that the 28th anniversary that the Rices were first introduced to the Alma King and the Rose. So it was first oh. introduced to them September 18th, and they purchased, it, purchased them on September 19th. Wow. So it's kind of an wow. anniversary day. Very cool. 20 yeah. years. That's very cool. Yeah. And I'm I would glad like you said to say, that. If George ever gets tired of his, we'd like to reunite them again. <laughs> <laughs> Wait a minute. We're in Colorado, too. <laughs> <laughs> so, George, the, the specimen, I understand, the king, sat in its mount on display for how many years before it was brought here? So, it, it was, uh, went in in 94, I think, right? Mm -hmm. 94 was when we installed it. And it sat there untouched basically until just a few days ago? And, and my expectation was that it would be there in perpetuity. Okay. Uh -huh. Sorry to, interrupt, so, sorry to interrupt that, but... So, uh, uh, you know, a few months ago, I get this email, and we all get emails, you know, you want a new Buick or whatever, please please call us, and we'll get it to you. And, I, and uh, Chris <laughs> sends me an email, and he goes, we're setting up the show, and we'd like to show the Alma King. And I go, right. <laughs> that's that's going to happen. <laughs> and then, but then Brian was copied on it. So... So I called Brian up and, and uh, said, is this legit? What, what's going on here? So we began to talk a little bit about what we're trying to do here to re revive the gems and mineral community in Colorado. And the fact that Brian was the one that was, would be putting this together here made all the difference in the world. No, no offense. But Brian <laughs> is, is a really class guy. I trust him implicitly. He is the GOAT of gems and minerals in Colorado, and he's my friend. And I, I have the greatest respect for him, and I, uh, you're the only reason that thing's sitting out there, believe me. Thank you very much, George. And I, I will tell you that some of you may believe that if you're the director of the museum, you're actually in charge. Nothing could be further th from the truth. <laughs> if your staff doesn't want to do something, or your board doesn't want to do something, or the insurance company doesn't want to do something, they will tie you up in so much red tape and create so many hurdles that they won't actually say no, but they're basically saying, 
good luck, buddy. <laughs> so what they had to go through and what everyone had to go through to make those pieces show up here, something we should all really appreciate. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Well, especially you, Joel. I, don't, I didn't mention it, but um, Joel was responsible for bringing the Alma Queen up here. <laughs> and with the hurricane coming into the Gulf, all the flights were canceled out of Houston, and that had to be in the case by 3 o'clock on Wednesday afternoon. Yeah. Joel personally drove that piece up here overnight, got up here, literally was here 20 minutes, handed it off to uh, somebody Chris. here, Chris. And then so drove all the way back down to Houston just so that exhibit could still take place. And he flew in this morning so he could be on this panel. And I knew that either Christoph or Brian would kick my ass if I didn't show up. So. I would say, though, I know that the King hit went through some uh, very tight security, too. We had two... Denver policemen escort the rock with your staff into right, this building right. yeah. and rode with them all the way from the museum to here. So that was a very important transaction. And I too. haven't slept a minute since it left, and I won't sleep again until it gets back. <laughs> <laughs> well, very good, very good. Does anybody have any other anecdotes or any, any stories or anything else you want to add? Well, I'd like yeah. to say that we did a trial run with the rose when we took it to Tucson, so we knew that this was going to be very possible. Um, so we had already gone through the exercise, and it was well received in Tucson a, f a few years ago. So this was a piece of cake after that. Not really. Yeah. <laughs> well, I saw them go in the case, and it wasn't a piece of cake and no, everything in there. No. I know that. Uh, it was a lot of work, and a lot of people contributed to get in, getting everything here. Mm -hmm. We're very, very grateful to, for that. Um, are there any questions? I bet there are. Some other questions from the audience? That's a good question. You know, I've been asked that before because you know, dreams can be important to us in our lives from time to time. And when you concentrate on something so much, sometimes they can start to take over and you have these, these weird kind of visions. So yes, we would, back in the day when we were doing the Alma, just before we found the Alma King and in the, in the days preceding that, not only myself, but some of the miners that were working with me that were passionate about mining would, would, would talk to me about, you know, dreaming about the living room. I mean, I remember one night, one of my, my miners came up and said, I had this dream, we were gonna drill right into a living room. And, and you know, I, and we drilled into the Alma King pocket within a couple of months after that. So it does, it does happen. I was on another dig once and, and had a similar experience. So I think you concentrate on something like that much, and it, it, it really can come true sometimes. Since we only have two or three more hours, can you tell us about some of your nightmares? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we could talk about some of the nightmares of mining, certainly. It's like we worked, I told you we were a couple of million dollars between pockets sometimes, and that's because one year we, we worked we, we, had, we had found the Alma King pocket, then we found something called the Good Luck pocket, and then we had a little bit of a hiatus. Two years went by and we didn't find anything. And uh, one year we drilled into something pretty nice, and one of the miners put the round, the, the blast holes in differently, and we blew up a four, a four foot long pocket of Jim Rotos on Matrix. Boom. That's a nightmare. That's oh, a nightmare. Wow. Yeah. So it can go both ways. You do everything not to have that happen, but yeah. Mining, mining is so hit and miss, as much effort as you put into it, science, hard work, you can still have a bad day. Actually, there's something I'm curious about, and maybe George and Brian can address this, but I know that you, George, at the museum have a very, very special reconstruction of what a vein looks like, at least the one side of it. Can you, can you guys talk a little bit about the reconstruction and what that means for the museum and how you, how you did it? Yeah, there, there's, a, there's actually two. There's one huge wall that's a replica from the Colorado School of Mines, and I don't think Brian's ever found a pocket that big, but there is a small pocket that I, I think is pretty representative of the kinds of things that we no, might the big, see. The big pocket is the real pocket we found, the big the, one you've got. The, the big wall is the one you found. The, the big wall was a real pocket, eight feet yep. in diameter. Yep. Yep. Yeah, I mean, it's just uh, incredible. What was it like to reconstruct that? Well, I wasn't there then, so I, I oh, can't really okay. say. Brian probably knows okay. more about that than... It looks spectacular. Yeah, I mean, it's just overwhelming. And I would add Aurora. that I went and visited the museum earlier this week when we, when I, you know, when we got here, and it was an impressive exhibit. The whole hall is impressive. It was really exciting to watch people respond um, to the, the pockets and the representations there, and they were disappointed that the king yeah. was there. And, but. and some of them are disappointed that 
the Alma King yeah. wasn't there. Yeah, but I encouraged them to come here to see it. So yeah, yeah, we good got for more you. People. Very good. So in Colorado, there's probably not another place that we would look with a mining activity like that, but there are some other producing mines in Colorado. And from time to time, we do partnerships with big mining companies to help, and go, help go recover. For instance, Climax, there's opportunities there if Climax stays open, and we've certainly been in touch with them. But uh, for us to do a primary operation like this in Colorado, we probably won't do that again. We have done it also in other places. With the experience we had at Sweet Home, we also went to China and did a, uh, were involved in a wonderful project there. And, and uh, for a brief time, we reopened the Pasta Bueno mine in Peru. But as I mentioned earlier, there aren't very many places you could do it. Roto is quite common, but it doesn't come in, a, in a, an exceptional enough form to, to go through the economic risk of putting together a project like that in very many places. So probably the answer to your question basically is probably no, that we won't do that again in Colorado. Renata, at the mine, at the mine museum, do you, you must have other rotocrosite specimens on display too, right? We do, but we don't own any. Hint, hint, nudge, nudge. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying, we're open for a nice donation. <laughs> I need to get over there and see your museum yes, again. You it's should. been a couple of years. Yes, yeah, and I, I, I do have one little, um, I guess, testimonial, and this is for all of you museum folk. Um, we get kids all the time coming in saying that it looks like watermelon Jolly Ranchers. Do you guys get that too? Yes. Oh yeah, we do. <laughs> yeah. Yep, that's how they describe Sweet Home Roto, watermelon Jolly Ranchers. <laughs> or cubes of jello or something like yeah. that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I would, uh, I would just add that, you know, having kids view the museums, it's yeah. so important because totally. we only, you know, we get to teach them about collecting and the importance of mining and specimens. But my office, um, our rhodochrosite is in our master gallery that houses a majority of um, the fine mineral specimens of the Rice family, and my office sits above it. And having the school tours go in and having the kids yell, wow, or, you know, they're so excited. You can actually hear them yeah. with the excitement of viewing it, and, you know, that makes all the work that we do worth it. Yeah, yeah. That's great. Wonderful. Thank you all on the panel. This has been a really wonderful discussion. Thank you.